So onward with section 2.6. The next topic is a slightly different kind of asymptote called an oblique asymptote. If the degree of the numerator of a rational function is one greater than the degree of the denominator, the graph has an oblique asymptote, less fashionably called a slant asymptote. Uh, the asymptote can be found simply by dividing the denominator into the numerator and expressing the function then as a linear term plus a term that goes to zero as x gets large, as x approaches plus or minus infinity. So it's long division that will lead you to the formula for an oblique asymptote. So the story here is rational functions, degree of the numerator is one greater than the degree of the denominator. For example, consider uh, this rational function, x squared minus 3 over 2x minus 4, quotient of polynomials. Degree of the numerator is 2, degree of the denominator is 1, so this has an oblique asymptote. Uh, in example 2.6.10, the long division is performed, and it's shown that uh, doing this division, we'll illustrate it with an example here shortly, different function, uh, we'll get x over 2 plus 1 and then some remainder term. And that remainder term uh, when divided by the 2x minus 4 will go to 0. What the graph looks like when a function has an oblique asymptote is the following. So <clears throat> if we'll take uh, x squared, so the information's in the picture, if we'll take this function, uh, x squared minus 3 divided by 2x minus 4. Perform the long division, you'll get x over 2 plus 1 with a remainder of 1. Take that remainder, put it over the divisor. And certainly, we should have a handle for this by now, but certainly this is going to go to 0 as x goes to infinity. So this x over 2 plus 1, this linear term part, <clears throat> is the oblique asymptote for this function. So what we get in terms of the graph is something like this. We'll graph the uh, y equals x over 2 plus 1 line as given here, line with slope 1 half. And what will happen, and we don't quite have uh, all the information to decipher all these other behaviors just yet, but we will uh, in this section. What happens is uh, when x gets large in the positive direction, the graph of the function in blue gets close to the oblique asymptote. When x gets large in the negative direction, the graph of the function gets close to the oblique asymptote as well. Uh, and I hesitate to mention, but in both on both sides, it uh, gets closer and closer, but never gets their situation. When dealing with rational functions, in some locations, this closer and closer, but never gets their story is valid. But don't take that as a definition of an asymptote, horizontal or oblique, as far as that goes. But it often is the case when we look at not very complicated functions. Um, in certain settings. This could well cross the asymptote somewhere, even if we've got a rational function. This one doesn't because it's, it's really not a very complicated function. Uh, looks like it's got a vertical asymptote at x equals 2, and we'll look at that shortly also using limits. <clears throat> so there's what we get in terms of the behavior of the graph when we have an oblique asymptote. Let's do an example, go through all the details. All right, consider this rational function, x squared minus one over two x plus four, find the oblique asymptote. All right, we'll do that here. Uh, we won't graph it just yet, and maybe we'll take a peek at some ideas about the graph, but we'll graph it in all its glory uh, before this section's out. But for now, we're just interested in the oblique asymptote. Okay, so this requires some long division. So we'll take uh, the numerator, x squared minus 1, divided by the denominator, 2x plus 4, usual long division with polynomials. What do you need to multiply by? Uh, looks like we need an x over 2 
to multiply by this to get x over 2 times 2x is x squared. And it gives us the x squared, so we can eliminate there. It also gives us, uh, what, a plus 2x. Okay, so x over 2 times 2x plus 4 produces x squared plus 2x. Subtract this, we lose the x squared, so we're going in the right direction. We pick up a negative 2x, bring the negative 1 down. Uh, subtract 1 up here, take negative 1 times 2x plus 4. That'll produce uh, negative 2x minus 4. Subtract, and we lose the negative 2x, and we've got a remainder of 3. So we can take the quotient and write it as um, x over 2 minus 1, this part here, plus the remainder, 3, over the denominator, the 2x plus 4. Uh, notice x over 2 minus 1 is a linear term, right? Knew that was going to happen because we've got second degree polynomial <clears throat> divided by first degree polynomial. Difference of the degrees is 1. That's when you get oblique asymptotes. All right. Uh, so we do indeed have an oblique asymptote, provided this, this part here, the 3 divided by 2x plus 4, actually does go to 0 as x gets large, as x approaches plus infinity, and as x approaches minus infinity. If we can demonstrate that, then we'll know that y equals x over 2 minus 1 is an oblique asymptote for the graph of this rational function. So let's check that. Okay. And you've got a fair amount of experience in this these days. This is the same, same routine. Limit as x approaches plus or minus infinity of 3 over 2x plus 4. Let's divide numerator and denominator by the highest power of x in the denominator. That is, divide numerator and denominator by x to the first power. <laughs> we'll do so by multiplying by 1 over x over itself, just a version of 1. We're good if x isn't 0. It's not. It's big. As explained previously, distribute. All right, now we've got a 3 over x in the numerator. We've got an x over x down here. We can cancel as long as x isn't 0. Yeah, we just said x is big, positive or negative, so x is not 0. So the cancellation is valid. All right, let's get that limit on these 1 over x's I see here, as we've done in the past, using uh, first a quotient rule to get the limit of the quotient. Let's do a little bit faster this time, as we've done so many of these. Let's bring that 3 outside of that numerator uh, using the constant multiple rule. Let's take the limit in the denominator and apply it to this sum. Limit of the sum is the sum of the limits. Get that and then bring the 4 outside of that limit. Okay, so uh, sum rule we used uh, uh, in the denominator, constant multiple rule we used in getting the 3 and the 4 out, and quotient rule we used in getting the limit in the quotient. And you know, the whole point was, of course, to get that limit on the 1 over x part. Limit as x approaches plus or minus infinity of 1 over x, in both cases, goes to 0. We get 3 times 0 over 2 plus 4 times 0. That's a 0 over 2, making sure I don't have any zeros in the denominator. That was established in example 2.6.1. So, indeed, this little term here does go to 0 for x large. All right, since that term goes to zero as x approaches plus infinity and as x approaches minus infinity, then indeed y equals x over two minus one is an oblique asymptote <clears throat> by the definition of oblique asymptote. All right, so that answers the question asked, but let's uh, do a little bitty bit more stuff. Uh, let's, let's actually graph it now. All right, this function isn't defined at negative 2. We get a division by 0 at negative 2. Uh, so that tells us something. It's not a point in the domain is all we're going to say about it right now. It tells us something about vertical asymptotes, uh, but more of that shortly. And after we've done the vertical asymptotes, we'll come back and analyze this in great detail, the remaining parts at least. <clears throat> all right, so we've got uh, the function written in this form. 
of what happens when X is big and positive. I wanna look at this little extra piece here. We've got the oblique asymptote, X over two minus one, and then this extra part. What's happening with this? Is this positive or negative? Say when X is big. Well, if X is large and positive, then this little extra term over here, it'll be positive. And if X is big and positive, then uh, the denominator will be big. Uh, the fraction will be small. We knew that from the limit property. Small and positive is what it'll be if X is large and positive. If X is uh, large and negative, take a big negative number, that denominator is going to be negative. If I take X big and negative, you know, like negative three will do it. I plug in x equals negative three, we're gonna get out negative two in the denominator, it's negative. You plug anything um, less than negative three in, bigger in magnitude than negative three, and of course that denominator is gonna be negative. So this will be a negative number when x is large and negative. So that tells us how the original function relates to the oblique asymptote. Is it above or below? It's the oblique asymptote plus a little bit. Sometimes that little bit's positive, sometimes that little bit's negative. That little bit is positive when X is big and positive. That little bit is negative when X is big and negative. So that tells us about whether the graph of the function lies above or below the oblique asymptote. Let's draw a picture. Okay, I've left uh, what happens at negative two or near negative two um, nebulous um, terra incognita. Uh, we'll take care of that later. But here's a graph that reflects the oblique asymptote part. So let's see, uh, here's y equals x over two minus one, written as a dotted line as we'll often do with asymptotes. And uh, indeed, the blue function gets close to the oblique asymptote on both sides, established by the limit as x approaches plus or minus infinity. Also, we said when x is positive, the remainder term, which is the distance from the asymptote to the blue line, was positive. So we had a little bit extra positive added to the asymptote to get the function. The, the little uh, extra term was positive over here, so that means the blue curve is above the asymptote. It was negative over here, so you've added a negative amount to the asymptote to get the function, and that means the function's below the asymptote over here. Oh, one last thing. This function is uh, zero at one and negative one, so I know we have intercepts of negative one and one along the x-axis. So. Uh, there's a graph that reflects pretty well what we know about this function. What we don't know is the, the negative two story, but we will soon, and that's how we'll um, address this question again later. But that picture, that reflects the oblique asymptote. It's got the right intercepts. Uh, given the information we know, that's a good picture of that function. So that'll do for now, but we'll do some more stuff here shortly. But first, back to the notes. Okay, so now we're gonna move to a different kind of infinite limit. There's two kinds in this section. But so far, we've considered what happens when the input value X approaches plus or minus infinity. Now we'll consider what happens uh, when the output value, the y value or the f of x value, gets arbitrarily large. So we've got input values and output values. When x approaches plus or minus infinity, that's the stuff we did previously. Now, what happens when the function gets arbitrarily large in the positive or negative direction? How are you going to define that? Well, let's look at the 1 over x function and use that as motivation. Okay, here's a graph of the 1 over x function in blue. They put little arrows on it, an uh, image from the book, uh, making you think about x getting close to zero and how the function reacts to such x values. But I want to look at it this way. Pick a big positive number. 
call it B. That's the reason they're using a B here. Can you make the graph of y equals one over x bigger than B? Which effectively means, can you make it above a horizontal line that passes through this point, zero comma B? Yeah, uh, if I make x close enough to zero and on the positive side, this function, that's why they put the arrow there, it heads upwards without bound. So no matter what giant number you choose for capital B, I can find, here we go with a, almost an epsilon delta kind of game, I can find x values sufficiently close to zero and positive, it'll give out function values bigger than that value. You go to a larger value, okay, I'll probably have to get a bit closer to zero, but I can get out values larger than whatever value you pose. So it's like the, we got no control over epsilon, but based on epsilon, we can find a delta. It's like that, except this time, in the beginning, there's an arbitrary big number. And then we got to figure out how close to make x to zero, such that function values are bigger than that big number. If we want to consider what happens over here, it's got a vertical asymptote over here as well. So actually, this is how we'll define vertical asymptotes. I'm a little ahead of the game on that verbiage. But what happens over here? Well, the function, it goes down, uh, if you will, <clears throat> towards negative infinity. There is no ad infinity, you know the story about that now. <clears throat> well, what's happening here is, uh, I'll pick a, a, a big negative number. Let's call it negative b. And then say, can you make the function lower than that big negative number? Yeah, by making x sufficiently close to zero and negative. One over x will be less than, below this big negative number. So you think of it as choosing big numbers and pushing the function towards infinity or pushing the function downward towards negative infinity. So that's the idea behind uh, the formal definition of a function having an infinite limit. Okay, and that verbiage is basically what uh, I just described uh, yeah, well, a little warning. Of course, there is no getting close to infinity. What there is is getting far from zero, uh, getting arbitrarily large, capital B, in the positive direction, or getting arbitrarily large in the negative direction, that capital or negative capital B. So uh, we could deal with this as the picture suggested in terms of one-sided limits or two-sided limits. We'll state a definition here for two-sided limits and draw pictures. And you ought to expect to see what um, yellow and green things and their intersection that's um, their yellow and blue things with an intersection that's uh, that's maybe green. That's that's actually what we've got in this one. In this one, uh, they didn't shade the blue very darkly, but that's exactly what's happening here. Okay, so the formal definition for infinity and negative infinity as limits is, first, you gotta make sure the function's defined in the right place. Here we're dealing with a two-sided limit, so we need F to be defined on an open interval containing C, except possibly at C itself, usual limit stuff, usual two-sided limit stuff, we say that f of x approaches infinity as x approaches c, and write, the limit's read that way, the limit as x approaches c of f of x equals infinity if for every positive real number, capital B, that's replaced the epsilon stuff in this setting, there exists a corresponding number delta greater than zero, okay, that's like before, such that for all x satisfying the absolute value of x minus c is greater than zero and less than delta implies f of x is greater than capital B. In other words, you can make f of x as big as you want. How big do you want it to be? Well, let's say capital B. Well, I can make it bigger than capital B by taking x values sufficiently close to c. The sufficiently close stuff is the delta stuff just like before. 
before we had arbitrarily close, but there is no close to infinity. There's only big. So I don't talk about getting close to infinity. The function values don't get close to infinity. They get big in this sense. You can make them arbitrarily big. So it's still an arbitrary something for a sufficient something else. The arbitrary something is the big number B. And the sufficiently close is the same thing as it was before. Uh, Going to be totally without an anthropomorphic idea on this one. I can't talk about the function getting close to infinity or trying to pass through the point at infinity. You may hear this verbiage out there uh, at, in a calculus class. It's not going to make any sense, though. Uh, there may be some more exotic settings, and it's not just the real numbers in calculus. It would be a different mathematical construct where there might actually be a point at infinity. But I regret in saying it already. In the real numbers and in calculus, there is no ad infinity. There's only far from zero. What if we wanted the thing to go in the negative direction? <clears throat> uh, then we'd take a, a negative b and basically say the same thing. We'd say the limit as x approaches c of f of x equals negative infinity if for every negative real number, think of it as being a big real number, big negative number, negative b, uh, there exists a corresponding delta such that when x is sufficiently close to delta is uh, sufficiently close to c within a distance delta, then f of x is less than negative b. Less than negative b, you're you're wanting it to go in the negative direction. You're wanting it to go down. So uh, here's a graph of a function. They've chosen a capital B. What kind of x values would you need to choose to make sure the function? is above this level B. Well, for this B value, we could go as far right as here, and we could go as far left as here. Well, choose the smaller of those two distances from C, this distance delta, and then we can go as far left as here, C minus delta, and as far right here, C plus delta, because of that symmetry condition. We've done this before, where we chose a minimum distance on either side of C. It's one little thing. Notice there's a, a little hard to see in the scanned image here, but there's a little line here indicating the C minus delta is this value here. It's not over here at this dotted line. There's, there's symmetry in what we have. And similarly, in the uh, picture, when we want the function to go below negative B, if the graph looks like this, how close to C do you have to get to get the function below negative B? Well, we can go as far to the right as here and as far to the left as here. We'll choose the minimum of these two distances, the distance from here to here, versus the distance from C to here. The smaller is this distance here. We'll choose that to be delta. This becomes C plus delta. Go the same distance to the other side, and there's a C minus delta. And when X is within distance delta C, it's in this blue band here, then the function values lie in the, in the green band. So it's, it's still the, the blue, yellow, and green ideas with the colored bands. Okay, uh, if you want something informal, I'm real careful with my informal things. My anthropomorphic things were arguably nonsensical, uh, but just meant to give you some intuitive ideas. But the informal stuff I'm careful with. I'd say the limit as x approaches c of f of x equals infinity if f of x can be made arbitrarily large by making x sufficiently close to c. And the arbitrarily large and the sufficiently close, this time it's the capital B stuff and the delta stuff. So that's what arbitrarily and sufficiently mean, kind of analogous to what we had before. You want to deal with one-sided infinite limits, uh, one of the exercises, and we'll do a piece of, of this exercise, one of the exercises deals with coming up with rigorous definitions for um, one-sided infinite limits. What we had up here was two-sided infinite limits. I can tell, say, by looking right here. When I see that uh, x is close to c um, in absolute value, the absolute value of x minus c is less than delta. That means x is close to c and what could be bigger than or less than C. 
either side of C, X could be on and have this condition satisfied. Hey, how would you change it into a one-sided limit? Um, do, do some slight modification of this. In some sense, get rid of the absolute value. That sense, depending on whether you want to take a limit as X approaches C from the left or the right, as we did when we did one-sided limits a couple sections ago. All right, let's prove something. We have a formal definition, so let's illustrate it. And we're gonna prove that if N is a positive even integer, even will play a role, it guarantees um, everything's positive that we're dealing with. Prove that the limit as X approaches zero of one over X to the N equals infinity. Hey, what happens if you plug in X equals zero? Don't do it in front of me. You anger me is what you do. Uh, zero is not in the domain of that function. We'd get division by zero and you can't do that. Not saying one over zero is infinity. I'm saying the limit as X approaches zero of one over X to the N equals infinity. Um, in these limbo, limit symbols, there's the understanding that that means X is not equal to zero. It's close to zero, but not equal to zero. There's never been any division by zero. There's been limits that if you don't know what you're doing with limits, you'd write one over zero. But don't do that on the test because I'll be watching or my grader will be watching and you'll lose points for that because you're not getting the details. Don't divide by zero. I've mentioned that before. Okay, so um, let's see. We got f of x is one over x to the n. That's defined everywhere except zero. Uh, so we need an open interval containing uh, c equals zero on which the function's defined, except possibly at zero itself. How about the interval negative one to one? This function's defined on the interval negative one to one, except possibly at zero. It's not defined at zero. All right, so the logic went, and when I do these examples, I'm probably trying to illustrate the logic. Let capital B be a positive real number. We want to show we can make this function bigger than capital B that's how we get out the limit to be positive infinity. Based on that, we need to choose a delta. I say, let's choose delta to be one over B to the one over N power, one over the nth root of B. All right, as usual, <clears throat> sit tight on that. Uh, we'll draw a picture and see where it came from. But uh, this is the logic. You're given an arbitrary B and then you cleverly choose a delta. Well, trust me, this is a clever delta to choose. We'll explain where it came from later. Right now, I'm looking at the logic of, I get an arbitrary B, I got no control over that. I need to find a delta, you know, that works for that B value. I'm choosing that one. Let's see what happens. And there's a picture that'll tell us we've done the right thing. All right, so then if we have a zero less than the absolute value of X minus C, Okay, C is zero, so that's the absolute value of X minus zero, which is just the absolute value of X. So if the absolute value of X is less than delta, we've chosen delta just now to be one over B to the one over N. Then we have uh, taking reciprocals of both sides of this inequality, absolute value of X is less than one over B to the one over N. Take reciprocals of both sides. You'll get a one over the absolute value of X here you'll get the reciprocal of this, which is just the B to the one over N on that side. Also, one over X function, that's a decreasing function. So that's gonna reverse inequalities, decreasing function when I input positive things, which we are, absolute value of X is positive. Remember X is not zero. And uh, whatever this thing is, is positive because B was positive. Okay, so, uh, taking reciprocals of both sides and reversing the inequality, we get one over the absolute value of X is greater than B to the one over N. All right, where are we going on this? We're trying to get out of this that um, F of X is greater than B, right? This is where we're trying to get to. That's what the definition said. If zero is less than the absolute value of X minus C is less than Delta, then f of x is greater than f of b. The very definition of limit of a function equals infinity. Okay, so we left off right here. 
it looks like we're going to get there soon. So we've got one over the absolute value of x to the n is greater than b. Uh, remember, n is even. n is an even integer. Okay. Uh, then the absolute value of x to the n and x to the n is the same. And if x is positive, no problem. If x is negative and n is even, take a negative number to an even power, square a negative number, you get a positive number out. So uh, x to the n is going to be positive whether x is, is positive or negative because the exponent is even. So that's how we'll get rid of the absolute values. And then we can say, okay, for the x values we're considering and for the fact that, that n is even, we can replace one over the absolute value of x to the n simply with one over x to the n. I don't need the absolute values. You can't just drop them but you can explain them away sometimes. And sometimes it's straightforward. We did just drop them, but we explain why. Sometimes not so much. Sometimes you have to introduce negative signs. That's what it's usually amounted to. But we get f of x is one over x to the n. That's the same as one over the absolute value of x to the n. We just showed that's greater than b. And that's exactly what we needed to show. If zero is less than x minus c in absolute value is less than delta, there's that information right there then f of x is greater than capital B. That's the definition of limit as x approaches zero of f of x equals infinity. f of x is one over x to the n. So there you go. Now, where did the delta come from up here? Let's see, we had this one over x to the n function and we wanted to get out um, this value b. When is it that one over x to the n equals b. What are the input values to get that? Fortunately, we got a, a graph that's symmetric with respect to the y-axis. Also follows the fact that uh, n is even. If n was odd, the function would go up from one side and go down from the other. We'd have to do one-sided limits to deal with this. So that's why I've chosen um, n even in this one. This is one I made up because I've labeled it with a letter. All right, well, what are you going to get out? What, what x value do I put here to get out um, b? Well, we'd have 1 over x to the n equals b. Take that formula, 1 over x to the n equals b. Take reciprocals of both sides and take the nth root of both sides. Raise it to the 1 over n power. And that will produce that you need an input value of exactly what we chose delta to be. So I don't have the algebra type set here, but that's exactly what you need. And that'll produce the value that we need for delta by symmetry is a nice symmetric function. I can go the same distance to the left and the right. Uh, here's a picture. I made this picture where I've got the yellow and the blue in their intersection being green. So it's the same kind of thing we had before. Instead of getting a little yellow band now, we get this infinite yellow thing because I want function values to be above here. I want them to be up here in the yellow part that, uh, that takes off um, upward. When does that happen? When I make the input values sufficiently close to zero in this little blue band. Input values in this little blue band, function values in this little green band, the intersection of the blue and the yellow. Same thing we had before with the colors, subtly different. Um, there's no cap on the top, so I don't have a yellow band and I don't have a little green box. I've got an unbounded yellow thing up here and an unbounded green box, if you like. So the box doesn't have a top on it. Um, it's, a, it's more of a band. But that's because we're considering limits as something goes to infinity. The same type of thing happened when we considered limits as x goes to plus or minus infinity also. Definition, finally, of a vertical asymptote. You've dealt with vertical asymptotes in your past, I'm sure. Uh, you didn't deal with them quite rigorously because you didn't have calculus. It takes this limit stuff to formally define vertical asymptotes. Uh, nonetheless, I'm sure you got some intuitive feel for what a vertical asymptote is. Here's what they are by definition. The line x equals a, the vertical line x equals a, is a vertical asymptote of the graph y equals f of x, if either the limit as x approaches a from the positive side of f of x equals plus or minus infinity, or the limit as x approaches a from the negative side of f of x equals plus or minus infinity. 
Remember how we're using the plus minus sign? Well, there are four things that we're letting in the door here to count as vertical asymptotes. The limit as x approaches a from the positive side of f of x equals positive infinity. The limit as x approaches a from the positive side of f of x equals negative infinity. Two that correspond to this one and similarly two that correspond to this. So that's what a vertical asymptote is. So now we want to figure out when functions have vertical asymptotes. When are the limits infinite? To streamline it, another Dr. Bob's theorem. You dealt probably with rational functions before. Recall, you'd look for vertical asymptotes of a rational function where the denominator is zero. Rational functions, ratios of polynomials. Remember, rational, it's a ratio of polynomials. You look for where the denominator is zero and you might find vertical asymptotes there, or you might not. It depends on some of the properties of the numerator. Just because the denominator is zero for a rational function doesn't mean that you necessarily have a vertical asymptote there. We might have some cancellation and the function might try to pass through a point and fail. Um, or it might have a vertical asymptote. I don't know, it depends on what the numerator is doing. But I can't say because the denominator is zero, there must be vertical asymptotes. I can say this, for rational functions, if it's got vertical asymptotes, they occur where the denominator is zero. So that's where we'll look for them. More precisely, we get the following. Dr. Bob's infinite limits theorem says, uh, let f of x be a ratio of functions. I didn't say a rational function. P and Q may not be polynomials. So we're going to deal with trig functions and a little bit with exponentials and logs. Suppose the limit as x approaches c of P of x equals L, which is not zero. So the numerator has a limit that isn't zero. And the limit as x approaches c of Q of x equals zero. The denominator has a limit of zero and the numerator has a limit of not zero. And Q of X is of the same sign on some open interval containing C, except possibly it's C itself. Then the limit as X approaches C of F of X is plus infinity or minus infinity. Uh, I'd have to go through and evaluate positive and negativeness to see if it is positive infinity or negative infinity. But this tells you when you've got an infinite limit. Uh, we could say the same kind of thing for a limit as x approaches c from the negative side and a limit as x approaches c <clears throat> from the positive side. I could say similar things for, for one-sided limits. Uh, this thing about um, the same sign on some interval containing c, uh, except possibly c itself, if we were dealing with rational functions and, and one-sided limits, I, I can kind of overlook this little part of the hypothesis, and we're usually dealing with rational functions. Uh, we're not always dealing with one-sided limits. We may be asked about limits and have to analyze them in terms of one-sided limits. But if we have a rational function, then we can simplify Dr. Bob's infinite limits theorem to the following. Let f of x be p of x over q of x be a rational function. So now I'm saying p and q are polynomials. That's predominantly the kind will work. Suppose the limit as x approaches c from the positive side of p of x is something but not zero. And suppose the limit as x approaches c from the positive side of q of x equals zero. Limit of the numerator is not zero. Limit of the denominator is zero. And we've got a rational function. Numerator and denominators are, are polynomials. Then we've got an infinite limit as x approaches c from the left-hand side. We could say something similar, uh, oops, we just said something, uh, sorry, it was right-hand side, wasn't it, positive side. Limit as x approaches c from the positive side in all cases. We could say similar things if we had a limit as x approaches c from the negative side, from the left. Uh, <clears throat> we could try to say something similar for rational functions um, for two-sided limits going to become a little bit more complicated. It might go to positive infinity from one side and negative infinity from the other. In fact, probably most of them we see will do that. 
So I can't draw the conclusion quite so quickly about a two-sided limit. For the same reason, I had this, this same sign um, condition up here in Dr. Bob's infinite limits theorem. But good news, we'll mostly consider one-sided limits and we'll apply this limited version of Dr. Bob's infinite limits theorem and we'll apply it to rational functions. Yeah, let's do one. All right, 2.6.54 <clears throat> has you um, calculate about four of these things. All right, we're gonna do uh, this and something quite similar to it and actually look at a graph here shortly. We're learning things about vertical asymptotes, which means we're learning things about graphs. Consider the function f of x is x divided by x squared minus one. Okay, we got a problem at one and we got a problem at negative one. That problem is division by zero. By the way, this is a rational function. Uh, we wanna explore the limit as x approaches one and negative one from the positive side and the negative side. So they've asked us four questions. Limit as, approaches, limit as x approaches one from the positive side. Limit as x approaches one from the negative side. Limit as x approaches negative one from the positive side. Limit as x approaches negative one from the negative side. So all four possibilities of the two points that are not in the domain of this function, where we get division by zero in the, in, from the x squared minus one term. Okay, well, got a rational function, numerator, polynomial p of x equals x, denominator q of x equals x squared minus one uh, throughout if we consider part A, a limit as x approaches one from the positive side, the numerator p of x, just the, the function x, of course that goes to one. The important thing about the numerator, it's got a limit that's not zero. According to Dr. Bob's infinite limits theorem, that's a desirable thing. The limit as x approaches one from the positive side of q of x, the denominator, x squared minus one. That's a polynomial. You can evaluate limits, two-sided and one-sided, by substitution for polynomials, and we'll get out zero. So the numerator has a limit of not zero, and the denominator has a limit of zero. Dr. Bob's infinite limits theorem, applied to rational functions, tells you, and that one-sided limit, it's plus or minus infinity. We just gotta figure out which one it is. Is it plus infinity, or is it minus infinity? Well, Let's figure out the sign of that function, the S-I-G-N sign, not the trig function sign, the plus or minusness. Let's figure out the plus or minusness of that function, x over x squared minus one, for appropriate x values. All right, what are we talking about here? Uh, x approaches one from the positive side. That means x is, uh, it's close to one, and it's on the positive side of one. It's a little bit bigger than one, a little bit greater than one. Okay, uh, well, the function x over x squared minus one, it factors into x over x minus one times x plus, plus one. So we got three factors here. Let's figure out uh, what the sign is of each of these factors. And then that'll tell us for these appropriate x values, whether the function's positive or negative. Okay, for such x, close to one and a little bit greater than one. We have X is positive, numerator's positive. In fact, numerator's close to one, so that's positive. X minus one is positive. See, X is close to one and a little bit bigger than one, greater than one. It's my impression that students like particular numbers. Okay, well, think of it as like 1.1 if you like particular numbers. When we subtract one, there's a little bit left. There's that point 0.1 left if we used 1.1. Does x equal 1.1? No, I can't tell you what x equals. That's the whole limit curse that we're suffering under. But if you wanna think x is a little bit bigger than one, like 1.1 or 1.01, when I subtract one, there's a little bit left, 0 0.1, 0 0.01. There's a little positive amount left. So since x is greater than one, then x minus one, it's positive. By the way, it's close to zero, it's small, but it's positive. So this factor, x minus one, that one's also positive. How about x plus one? 
when X is close to one and a little bit greater than one? Well, it's close to two and a little bit greater than two. Well, if it's close to two, then the factor's positive. So we've got a positive for all three factors when X approaches one from the positive side. So let's draw a little diagram. Here's the function x over x squared minus one. Here it is factored, factoring the denominator. For these appropriate x values, we found this implies, this little imply symbol. Um, this isn't really an equation, but I think it's useful. That's why I didn't put an equal sign there. Um, the numerator was positive. Uh, actually, all three factors were positive. So we got a positive divided by a positive times a positive. That yields a positive. All right, we knew from Dr. Bob's infinite limit theorem that this limit was plus or minus infinity. We just saw for x close to one and slightly greater than one that this quantity is going to be positive. So where's it going to go? Positive infinity, not negative infinity. So the way you do these is find where the asymptotes might be. Uh, Dr. Bob's infinite limit theorem will it'll tell you where they are. If it's a rational function, it'll tell you where they are easily. Um, then check the signs. So if you know the limit is infinite, then it's a matter of, well, is it plus or minus infinity? Take appropriate x values. That's where you're going to have to think about the gets close to stuff. And check and see what these factors are one at a time. Take all the factors together. So if you get a positive or a negative, you get a positive, then the limit is positive infinity. You get a negative, like we're about to do, negative infinity. Okay, let's take a limit as x approaches one from the negative side. Well, the limit of the numerator is still one and the limit of the denominator is still zero. We're just approaching one from the other side. Those are polynomials, so there's no change in that. Dr. Bob's infinite limits theorem tells you then that the limits plus or minus infinity. We just have to determine if the limits positive infinity or negative infinity. We're going to do a lot of that in this problem. Well, let's analyze the signs again. Okay, a little bit of it gets buried here at the bottom, but we've got it factored. Appropriate x now, since x approaches one from the negative side, would be x close to one and slightly less than one on the negative side of one. So if you like particular numbers, you're thinking uh, like 0 0.9, 0 0.99, something like that for the x values. All right, so for such x values, the numerator x, remember we had the x, was well, positive. Uh, x is close to one. So, so the numerator is close to one, the numerator is positive. x minus one, this is a tricky one because that one's close to zero. Is it close to zero in positive or close to zero in negative? Well, x is um, approaching one from the negative side. Let's look at there so I can call attention to it. X is approaching one from the negative side. So it's close to one, but it's a little bit less than one. It's on the negative side of one. So when you subtract one away from it, you're getting a little negative number out. X minus one, it's negative. It's close to zero, but it's negative for such x values. x plus one, x is close to one, that's close to two, so that one's positive. So now we've got positive, positive. It was the x minus one that was the only one that's tricky. That's where if you substitute in, and don't substitute in, because this is a limit question, unless you got a polynomial. But this is the one that's gonna have a, a limit value of zero. So I gotta check and see if it's close to zero and positive or close to zero and negative. The other factors are straightforward. They're, they're close to one and two, which, is, which are both positive. So uh, we got positive, positive, and a negative. Multiply and divide, that produces a negative. We already knew the limit by Dr. Bob's infinite limits theorem was gonna be plus or minus infinity. We just saw we're getting function values that are negative for such x values. The limit must be negative infinity. All right, so it changed from positive infinity to negative infinity when we approached one from the positive side versus the negative side. They don't always change like that. Um, when we had that uh, one over x to the n where n was even, it didn't change from one side to the other. It went up from both sides. This one goes up on one side and down on the other. 
we'll draw a graph of not this one, but a related function. Here's the next example. All right, what about negative one from the positive side? Okay, uh, let's look at the numerator and denominator again. Numerator is just the function x. When x gets close to negative one from the positive side, this will have a limit of negative one. It's a polynomial. You can substitute in. You can substitute in for polynomials. <clears throat> you can substitute in for rational functions when you don't get division by zero. And a few other times you can substitute in to evaluate limits. It's, it was a complicated story. Polynomials were okay. Rational functions when we don't get division by zero were okay. And that's all we need here. All right, so uh, we can substitute in here to get uh, negative one out. The important thing about negative one is it ain't zero. So the numerator has a limit, it's not zero. The denominator, limit as x approaches negative one from the positive side, x squared minus one, can you substitute in? Yeah, it's a polynomial. Theorem 2.2, substitute in, you get out zero, as we had before. So we've got the numerator has a non-zero limit, the denominator has a zero limit. For a rational function, that means vertical asymptote. Dr. Bob's infinite limits theorem. So the limit as x approaches negative one from the positive side is plus or minus infinity. We just need to determine if it's positive or negative infinity. So we'll do a sign check. All right, so we'll analyze the signs, this time for x approaching negative one from the positive side. So x is close to negative one, but on the positive side, but a little bit greater than negative one, like negative 0.9, negative 0.99. Okay. Um, for such x, what about x? Well, it's negative. It's, it's close to negative one. X was getting close to negative one, whether it's to the left or the right. X itself is negative. X minus one. This one's easy this time. If X is close to negative one, X minus one is close to negative two. It might be a little bit bigger or less than, but anyhow, it's negative. This time it's the X plus one that's a tricky one. That's close to zero for appropriate X values. Yeah, but close to zero and positive or close to zero and negative? Well, X is greater than negative one, approaches one, negative one from the positive side. So X plus one, it's going to be close to zero and positive. Like if, if X was like 0.9 and we added one to it, I'm sorry, uh, negative 0.9. If X were like negative 0.9 or negative 0.99 and we added one to it, we get a little positive number, 0.1 or 0.01 in, in those particular cases. So indeed X plus one is positive in this case. So now, we had, let's see, we had X is negative, so the numerator is negative. Uh, X minus one is negative, okay, there's the X minus one. And X plus one uh, was positive, so we get a positive there. Multiply this out, you got two negatives, we'll actually end up with a positive. We already knew the limit was gonna be plus or minus infinity. Well, it looks like we're getting positive numbers out, whoops, for these X values. And so the limit must be positive infinity. You remember the little story, they don't, they don't put the plus sign there in the book. I've written the notes out like that. You want to put plus signs on here to distinguish it from negative infinity, you go right ahead. Uh, it's, it's not at all unreasonable to do. Okay, they wanted the, the fourth limit, which would be what? The limit as X approaches negative one from the negative side. Any guesses as to what's going to happen? It's going to be the same, same story again. Um, what'll happen is, That'll be the same, the X, the X minus one will be the same. It's this one that's gonna be different. Here we had X a little bit greater than negative one, and the next one we'll have X a little bit less than negative one. This sign will change, and it'll change to negative. So let's watch it happen. Okay, same story. We get a vertical asymptote by Dr. Bob's infinite limits theorem. Uh, it's arguably it's a different limit. Uh, we're approaching negative one from the negative side now. Yeah, but the numerator and the denominator have the same limits as they had before. Dr. Bob's infinite limits theorem still tells you. So you get a plus or minus infinity for the limit as X approaches negative one from the negative side. We just need to do a sign test. Okay, 
um, close to negative one, x will be close to negative one. So x itself is negative. We'll get that numerator to be negative. x minus one for such x, x values is close to, uh, close to negative two. So x minus one will be negative. It's the same thing we did before. All the details are written out here in the, on the slides. It's the x plus one that's the tricky one because that gets close to zero. So let's see, x close to negative one and less than negative one on the negative side of negative one, that's like negative 1.1 or negative 1.01 on the negative side of negative one. If it helps you to draw a little number line, that's a good idea. If we'll uh, add one to such an x value, there's a little bit of negative amount left over. If we took uh, x to be negative 1.01, and we added one to it, we'd have that negative 0.01 part left over. There'd be a little bit of a negative part left over. So x plus one is negative. x, x minus one, same as they were in part c. This is changed from positive to negative here, as it will always do when we have these linear factors. Uh, well now we've got a quotient or product involving three negatives due to the multiplication and the division. We get a negative sign. So the limit is negative infinity. All right, I did draw a picture for this one. Okay, so here's what we know. We know the limit as x approaches negative one from the negative side that'd be these x values here, is negative infinity. It means the graph goes down. Yeah, that was, that was the last part we did. We saw the limit as x approaches negative one from the positive side was positive infinity. The graph goes up here. You wanna plot any points? Well, at x equals zero, the function is zero. So it passes through the origin, by the way. Just what the hell, let's graph that point. As x approaches positive one from the negative side, we had a negative infinity. Limit, so the function goes down. Limit as x approaches positive one from the positive side, function went up. So the graph of that function, in terms of the asymptotes, it looks a lot like this. What happens over here for x large and over here for x large, x large and positive and x large and negative? Well, you know, terra incognita again. Um, not that we don't know how to do that. Uh, we could check and see what happens when x is large and positive for this function. What do you think is going to happen? The, the limit's going to be zero. Uh, and it actually, it as well, it has a horizontal asymptote of zero. So there's how you deal with vertical asymptotes for rational functions using calculus. Okay, we want to do another one. All right, back to another example. All right, this one says, Consider y equals f of x equals 2x over x squared minus 1. Okay, this is just twice the function we just had. Uh, it's got all the details in it. So um, maybe we'll gloss over the details. We just did all these sign analysis things. All right, they want us to find the domain, the horizontal asymptotes, the vertical asymptotes, and to graph it in a way that reflects the asymptotic behavior and find the range. You kids good at finding ranges? Well, you're no better at finding ranges than you are graphing. You need a graph to find a range, usually, uh, unless it's a simple, simple function. So finding ranges is actually, it's, it's complicated. It's as complicated as graphing in general. All right, well, we'll have a graph, so we'll be able to determine the range. It's the last thing we'll do. All right, they want the domain. Well, let's take this function and factor it. Okay, it's just like the one we were just doing, except it's got a two up here. Uh, you got any problems with um, x values? The domain is all x, uh, yeah, except for negative one and one, where we get division by zero. So we throw those out. The domain is written in terms of a union of intervals. You take the real number line from negative and infinity to infinity and kind of <laughs> knock out negative one and one and write it as this union of open intervals. So there's a domain, functions defined for everything except for negative one and one. There's how you write it as a union of intervals. How about horizontal asymptotes? Okay, this is getting a bit redundant, uh, but 
I know how to find horizontal asymptotes. I divide the numerator and denominator by the highest power of x in the denominator. Take a limit as x approaches, plus or minus infinity. We can do those together because this is a rational function. It'll do the same thing in the positive direction as it does in the negative direction. If it ain't a rational function, then I gotta do the positive and negative separately, possibly. So we'll multiply by one over x squared, as we've done. That produces, distributing produces this. You know what we're gonna do. We're gonna quotient rule it to get the limit on the numerator and the denominator. Um, I'm gonna bring constants out front. That two will come out front here. Uh, here we've used the difference rule in the denominator. We've used the power rule to get the limit of the one over x by itself. It's by itself here by itself here and it's squared. Uh, and then use the fact that, hey, this limit is zero. Limit as x approaches plus or minus infinity and one over x is zero. Example 2.6.1, we proved half of it. So we get uh, zero here and here. That gives us two times zero over one minus zero squared. That's zero over one. It will duh. Just making sure I don't have any zeros in the denominator. Zero over, zero over one, not a problem. One over zero, something's wrong. So I'm just making sure I don't get zero in the denominator. We didn't, and that equals zero. Uh, that limit it being zero tells us y equals zero is a horizontal asymptote of this function. How about your vertical asymptotes? Where are you going to look? Negative one and one. At those points, numerator has a non-zero limit. It's two or negative two, depending on which I approach. And the denominator has a limit of zero, just like the example we just did. So if we want to explore one-sided limits as x approaches negative one and as x approaches positive one, that's four one-sided limits. It's really similar to what we just did. So let me do this a little bit faster in the video, the notes are available for you to go through slowly. It's the same thing we just did. Uh, say x approaches negative one from the positive side. What you got there? x is um, close to negative one and a little bit bigger than negative one, like negative 0.9. What's that tell you about these factors? x is negative, it's close to, uh, it's close to negative one. Two x is close to negative two. Uh, we're approaching negative one. So x minus one, it's close to negative two. So we get a negative there. It's this one that's the interesting one. Close to negative one, a little bit greater than negative one, add one. There's a little positive part left over. We'll get that that term is positive. We got a negative, negative, positive, yields a negative. The limit must be positive infinity for these x values. Same thing we just did in the previous example. Let's do it three more times. Let's not, let's look at the, uh, the punchline. X approaches negative one from the negative side, same kind of analysis. Hey, the X plus one, it changes from positive to negative. When we go to the other side, now we've got three negatives, a negative, and the limit is negative infinity. How about positive one? Positive one from the positive side. Let's see, X is close to one. Numerator will be close to two, which is positive. This term here will be close to one plus one is two, which is positive. What about X minus one? Close to one and bigger than one, like 1.1. Subtract one, there's a little positive piece left over. Positive, 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 limits positive infinity. You knew the limits would be infinite by Dr. Bob's infinite limit theorem. What happens when we look at X approaches uh, positive one from the negative side? Uh, this one will change to negative. Sure enough, this one, x minus one factor changes to negative, same analysis. We get a negative out this time, and so the limit is negative infinity. All right, so we can graph it. And yeah, the graph looks a whole lot like that previous we had, except we know what happens in terms of horizontal asymptotes because we checked it this time. So we get a graph that looks like this. A uh, vertical asymptote at negative one goes down because that limit was negative infinity as we approach negative one from the negative side. Um, 
limit as x approaches one from the negative side was negative. Approaching one from the negative side, yeah, the function goes down like it's supposed to. And we had these other infinite limits and we had the horizontal asymptote of y equals zero. That's the first thing we checked. Uh, oh, the range, what y values do you get out? You get all of them out. Actually, between negative one and one, you get all of them out from this piece and then this piece here. I, I get a bunch of them out more than once. I get, I get each of them out twice except for zero. Uh, I might make a mention um, in terms of the horizontal asymptote. Does this function get closer and closer to zero but never get there? Well, it does get there. It crosses the asymptote right there. If I go far enough out, yeah, over here it gets closer and closer to zero and it never gets there. Over here it gets closer and closer to zero from the other side, from the negative side, and it never gets there. Because this is a rational function, if I'll go far enough out, I'll find that closer and closer but never gets there behavior uh, on the extremities. But it does get to zero, it takes on the value zero right there. So a function can cross its asymptotes and it needn't get closer and closer as we've seen by an example in the previous section, was it or was it this section? Uh, but for rational functions, you will see that closer and closer but never gets their behavior at the extremes. But not all functions are rational functions and that's not what a horizontal asymptote is. All right, so let's see. Uh, we're getting there, what's left? This idea of um, a dominant term, more limits as x approaches plus or minus infinity is what the topic is. So last idea, last topic in this section is a generalization of the idea of an oblique asymptote. Take a polynomial function, f of x, something x to the n, x to the n minus one, down to x in a constant term, usual polynomial formula. A dominant term of uh, this function as x approaches plus or minus infinity is the function consisting of this highest power of x and its coefficient. So that's what we're taking as a dominant term. The idea then is that uh, when x is large, f and g, they look roughly the same. And this is approximately the same size as, as that. The g of x and the f of x are approximately the same size. And the idea being when x is big, x to the n is huge. And it's way bigger than all this other stuff. So all that other stuff becomes relatively small when x is sufficiently large. So the graph of the polynomial will be close to the graph of this thing here. It's called a monomial. Um, uh, multiple of a single power of x. You know how to graph these? Yeah, well, maybe. Uh, x to the n is not that hard to graph. Precisely, we've got a dominant term when the limit as x approaches plus or minus infinity of f of x over g of x equals 1. So we get a limit of that ratio to be 1. And yeah, the graphs are close together when x is large. Let's do an example of that and then uh, a few more examples. Okay, so here's a polynomial function. Show g of x equals 3x to the fourth is a dominant term of f. All right, it's actually pretty easy. It's easier than what we've been doing. We just need to show the limit as x approaches plus or minus infinity of f of x over g of x equals 1. All right, well f of x is this thing here, that polynomial of degree 4, g of x is 3x to the fourth. That gave us that stuff. We need to take a limit of that. Okay, we're gonna do what? Divide numerator and denominator by the highest power of x. You know, actually, since the denominator is so simple, it's easier than that. That would work. You divide numerator and denominator by x to the fourth and, and off you go. But we can actually just divide the denominator into each of these pieces and split it up, kind of common denominator backwards style. <clears throat> Then we can cancel the powers of x. Cancel here, uh, you've got a three over three, and one. Cancel here, uh, we've got a two and a three. There's one of the x's left here. Here there's uh, the three and a three. I could cancel those if I like. Um, I have an x squared left in the denominator. Here we've got an x cubed left in the denominator. 
nothing changes here. I could simplify this six divided by three. You're good to go as long as X is not zero. It isn't, it's big, big and, uh, big and positive or big and negative, which is A X approaches plus or minus infinity on this one. All right, uh, then it's just a matter of getting this limit on each of those one over X's. So, you know, the story, here's where we left off. We'll use sum and difference roles to get the limits on all the little pieces. We'll bring the, um, the two thirds out front and the five thirds out front. Uh, the six over three is a two, bring that out front, constant multiple rule. And um, take the limit inside the squaring function there, the cubing function there, and the fourth power function there, power rule. So I skipped a bunch of steps in this because we've done so many of these. And constant, limit of one. One over x, limit of zero. One over x, one over x, zero, zero. Do the arithmetic, we get one out, justified by example 2.6.1. Oh, and that's what we needed. Since the limit's one, then g is a dominant term of f, and that's what they wanted us to show. So showing you have a dominant term is simply showing a limit of this sort equals one. And it's, it's fairly straightforward. You created a rational function that was even easier to analyze than some of the other rational functions we've analyzed with these infinite limits. Here's your rational function, uh, x squared minus one over two x plus four. Find all asymptotes, and graph it in a way that reflects the asymptotic behavior. All right, let's see. Um, this is number 108. We dealt with this at the beginning of this video, in fact, uh, and we found the oblique asymptote was x over two minus one. So we already have the oblique asymptote. Now we just need to look for vertical asymptotes. Uh, can't have a horizontal asymptote because it has an oblique asymptote. As x approaches plus or minus infinity, it behaves similar to this. So no horizontal asymptotes. Has an oblique asymptote. Asymptote with slope one half, in fact. Uh, but what's up with um, vertical asymptotes? Well, it's going to have them at negative two, if it if it has them there where the denominator is zero, that's where you'd look for asymptotes of a rational function, it might not have them. Uh, let's use Dr. Bob's infinite limits theorem and see if it does. Uh, if we take um, a limit as x approaches c of f of x, we can just substitute in provided c is not negative two. So we've got nice continuity everywhere except at negative two. Cont continuous on its domain, everything but negative two. And Dr. Bob's infinite limits theorem says, what happens to the numerator at negative two? Numerator goes to, uh, let's see, c squared minus, c squared minus one uh, goes to negative two squared minus one is three, there we go. Numerator goes to three, which is not zero. Denominator goes to zero. So we've got a numerator that's not zero in the limit, a denominator that is zero in the limit. Dr. Bob's infinite limits theorem tells you, then the limit as x approaches negative two of f of x is plus or minus infinity. We just need to figure out which. And that's enough to tell you vertical asymptote at negative two. We'll have to explore it in terms of one-sided limits and look at factors just like we did before. Okay, so we'll analyze the sign of x squared minus one over two x plus four. See if it's positive or negative, then we can draw a conclusion about plot plus infinity or minus infinity as a one-sided limit. Limit as x approaches negative two from the positive side, what's up with that? We'll take this x squared minus one. Uh, I can factor it if you like. I can also say, hey, close to negative two, uh, that numerator is close to three it's positive. You want to factor it and do it the way we did before, go right ahead. Um, but since we're approaching negative two, that's the point of interest. The numerator is close to three, which is positive. So it's really just the denominator that I need to analyze, and it'll be the tricky one. Close to negative two and bigger than negative two. What's the sign of two x plus four under those conditions? Uh, it's close to zero. Close to zero and positive or close to zero and negative? 
Well, we've got a number a little bit bigger than negative two. If it helps you think about it as uh, what? Bigger than negative two, greater than negative two, I should say. Uh, negative 1.9, 999. A little bit bigger than negative two, being negative one point something. When we multiply that by two, we'd get something uh, a little less than negative four. Add four to it, there's a little positive bit left over. If you want to think in terms of specific numbers, you'll, you'll be fine. It's just to reach the conclusion of positive that you need. So 2x plus 4 in this case is positive. We got a positive in the numerator, positive in the denominator, yielding a positive and a limit that's positive infinity. What happens when we look at x approaching negative 2 from the negative side? Uh, that factor 2x plus 4, it'll change from positive to negative. Convince yourself of that. The details are all given here. Numerator still close to three. When I do the sign test, we'll have a positive over a negative, which yields a negative. And this time the, li the, net <clears throat> the limit is negative infinity. All right. So we found vertical asymptotes at negative two. It goes up on one side and down on the other. It has an oblique asymptote of y equals x over two minus one. This is what we had before, except we had a, a cloud of unknown behavior here and here because we only knew about the uh, oblique asymptotes. We knew which side of the function, which side of the oblique asymptote that the function was on. It's above the, the oblique asymptote over here and below it over here. That was described when we first looked at exercise 108. And now we see we've got these um, this vertical asymptote at negative two. X approaches negative two from the negative side, that's this side, uh, negative infinity, it goes down. From this side, it goes up. Remember, uh, it has the intercepts of negative one and one. That's where the numerator is zero, so that yields X intercepts. Um, now, that takes care of, let's see, the oblique asymptotes, the vertical asymptotes. They ask us for anything else. I guess that was it. Can you tell me the range on this one? You got a graph. Um, not really. I don't know. Um, it misses, it looks like it misses some of the y values. But with what we know about the graph, I can't tell you which y values it misses. Uh, not, not so sure what we're getting out um, in terms of missed y values. Uh, it looks like it outputs everything greater than zero and some stuff less than zero, but I don't know which stuff. We'll have the information to figure out how low the function goes on this side and how high it goes on this side uh, at some point in the future. But right now, gee, we got a graph and I still can't tell you what the range is. Finding ranges is hard. Okay, this is a find a function that satisfies certain behaviors question. They want you to find a function g that satisfies the following. The limit as x approaches plus or minus infinity of g of x equals zero. They want it to have a horizontal asymptote of zero. Limit as x approaches three from the negative side of g of x is negative infinity. Limit as x approaches three from the positive side of g of x is positive infinity. All right, they want it to have a vertical asymptote at x equals three of that sort. Graph y equals g of x, uh, in a way that reflects the asymptotic behavior. All right, find a function and graph it. When a graph it'll be easy because I know what they want it to have uh, in terms of horizontal and vertical asymptotes. All right, so let's see what we can do with these conditions. Since we want the limit as x approaches plus or minus infinity of g of x to be zero, the graph of y equals g of x will have a horizontal asymptote of y equals zero. Y equals this value here. Um, It'll have vertical asymptote at x equals three with this kind of behavior, right? That's just the definition of horizontal and vertical asymptotes. Let's try to find a rational function. Anything else would be far too exotic. So let's try to find a rational function that satisfies these conditions. Um, we'll make polynomial P of degree less than polynomial Q. So if the numerator is of a degree less than the denominator, and we've seen many examples of this, that'll guarantee we get a horizontal asymptote of y equals zero. That's the plan. We'll check it. When I come up with a candidate, we'll compute the limits and make sure we got it right. 
but let's use that as a strategy. Okay, um, if we have x minus three in the denominator and not in the numerator, then that'll give us uh, a vertical asymptote of x equals three. Um, it might not go up and down in the right way. We'll adjust it if necessary. But uh, let's put an x minus three in the denominator and let's make the numerator smaller degree than the denominator. It says degree less. Um, how about we just try this as a denominator? That'll give the vertical asymptote and make the numerator one. So let's try that. Let's try p of x equals one and q of x equals x minus three. It'll work as we'll see, but there's, there's reasoning behind it. Degree zero polynomial, degree one polynomial. That'll have the right horizontal asymptote. X minus three in the denominator and not in the numerator, that'll have vertical asymptotes. So I think we're good for, the, for this limit with that function. My only concern is, you know, this might be positive infinity and that might be negative infinity for these particular choices. If it is, we'll just adjust it by a negative sign. So let's try g of x equals one over x minus three. We might have to adjust the sign of g to get the proper one-sided limits at three, this negative infinity versus positive infinity thing. But there's a strategy behind picking this. Uh, this is as simple as we can make it. Why make it more complicated? Okay. Uh, so let's check a uh, limit as x approaches plus or minus infinity, one over x minus three. We'll multiply by the highest power of x in the numerator and denominator, that's x to the one. We'll distribute, uh, simplify. There's some simplification been done here. We cancel this x with that x to produce this one. Otherwise we get some over x stuff in a couple of places. We'll use the quotient rule to get the limit in the numerator and denominator. We'll use a difference rule with this difference in the denominator. I'll bring that three outside of that limit. So that was a constant multiple rule. We've used all these rules that we always use. And numerator, that goes to zero, that goes to one, minus three times zero, we get zero over one minus three times zero. I recommend you write this out as silly as it looks and make sure you ain't getting division by zero as long as you're dividing numerator and denominator by the highest power of x in the denominator, you won't be getting zeros in the denominator, but it's a good idea just to double check. We got zero over one, no problem. That equals zero. Uh, so y equals zero is a horizontal asymptote and they wanted y equals zero to be a horizontal asymptote. Awesome. Uh, we need to check the vertical asymptotes now. Okay. Uh, does it in actually have these infinite limits? Yeah, the, the numerator was one, so the limit of the numerator is one. The denominator was x minus three. Limit as x approaches three is zero. So Dr. Bob's infinite limits theorem, we're dealing with a rational function, tells you the limit as x approaches three of g of x will be plus or minus infinity. Well, I have to do one-sided limits. It could do one thing on one side and one thing on the other. And in fact, it does. Okay, limit as x approaches um, three from the positive side. I know we're gonna get infinity out. Let's do a sign test. This one's a little easier because there's only one thing that'll affect the sign. The numerator is one, numerator is positive. X is close to three and a little bit bigger than three. You subtract three, there's a little bit left, a little positive piece left. We'll get positive out and the limit's positive infinity. I know I'm doing it fast. We've done a lot of these. Pause the video and think about it. And all the details are written out on the slide. When we take a limit as x approaches three from the negative side, same idea. What'll happen is x minus three for these x values. These are close to three and less than three, like 2.9. You subtract three, you get a negative 0.1. You get a little negative part left over. So that denominator is gonna switch from positive to negative, we'll have a negative limit then, and the limit as x approaches three from the negative side of uh, one over x minus three is negative infinity. All right, so 
we didn't have to adjust it, right? I was worried I might get a positive infinity here and a negative infinity there. X approaches three from the negative side and got negative infinity out. Yeah, yeah, it worked out. If it didn't, I could change the numerator to negative one and that would flip the signs on these and then we'd be good to go. Uh, the graph must look something like this. It's got the horizontal asymptote here, got the vertical asymptote here. Approaching three from the negative side, it goes down. Approaching three from the positive side, it goes up, as it should. Uh, this is a function that satisfies those conditions. Yeah, I could, uh, I could make it more complicated if I was so possessed. I could give it more vertical asymptotes, for example. I'm why bother. Uh, but this is a solution to the question they ask, and this is a simplest solution to the question they ask. All right, one final problem from this section. Use the formal definition of infinite one-sided limits to prove, prove the limit as x approaches 2 from the negative side of 1 over x minus 2 equals negative infinity. Prove it. None of the Dr. Bob's infinite limit theorem stuff. Prove it with the B's uh, negative infinity and just prove it with the negative B's and the deltas. All right. Uh, first, we need a formal definition of this. It's got to mention this. This is exercise 99, one of the pieces of it. Uh, what we mean by limit as X approaches C from the negative side of F of X equals negative infinity is the following. We need function F to be defined on an interval of the form A to C. It's got C as a right-hand endpoint. So that means the function is defined close to C and for numbers less than C. Remember what we're going to do. We say that f of x approaches negative infinity as x approaches c from the left, from the negative side, written as this. If, okay, you wanna to go to negative infinity, every negative real number, negative b, there exists a corresponding delta such that, okay, we wanna say x is close to c and less than c. So what we'll do is borrow the same idea we had when we dealt with regular one-sided limits. We'll say x is less than c and greater than c minus delta. So the delta makes it close to c, and this less than right here makes it less than c. It's close to c and less than c. Implies f of x is less than negative b. Remember, we're trying to, uh, uh, wink, wink, trying to push the function to negative infinity. We want the limit to be negative infinity. So that's what the definition would be uh, for such a one-sided infinite limit. It's part C of exercise 99. Uh, the other three parts are, well, what if you want it to be positive infinity and you want to come towards C from the other side? You just tweak this little bit here, reverse some inequalities, use a positive B instead of a negative B as appropriate. The outline will be similar though. Okay, so we're dealing with F of X equals one over X minus two. That's a function we're given. Uh, is this defined on such an interval? Yeah, it's, uh, say it's defined from negative infinity to two. We're taking a limit as uh, x approaches c, two, x approaches c equals two. So here's your interval from something to two. It's defined um, up to two. Uh, that'll do for a one-sided limit of this sort. If we were taking a limit from the other side, then I'd look at something involving numbers greater than two. But this will do for what we need. We have c equals two. So we need to let negative b be any negative real number. We need to choose a delta. Okay, we're dealing with a reciprocal function here. If you're getting the hang of this, you might not be surprised. I'm going to choose delta equals 1 over b. b is, negative b is negative, so 1 over b is positive. b itself is positive. 1 over b is positive, so that indeed it is a positive number. Let me choose that. I'm again trying to illustrate the logic of this this delta capital negative B stuff. All right, we need to show that if this happens, that is if two minus delta is less than X is less than two, then F of X is less than negative B. So it's gonna work. Let's grind through the computations. Two minus delta, less than X, less than two. Um, let's subtract two from each of these. 
that'll preserve the inequality. That'll give us, uh, we'll lose the two there. That'll give us negative delta is less than, we'll subtract two from this, get X minus two, subtract two from two and get zero. Gives us negative delta is less than X minus two is less than delta. Okay, so we got us a little collection of negative numbers here. They're all less than zero. Um, let's take reciprocals. I'm taking reciprocals because I'm, I'm looking for a one over X minus two. If I take reciprocals, I'll get a one over X minus two. Of course, I can't take a reciprocal over there on the right because over there on the right, we got a zero. But I can use the left-hand part of the inequality. Take a reciprocal. Um, the one over X function, the reciprocal function is a decreasing function. When you input negative values, it goes downhill. So that means I have to reverse the inequality. So I take a reciprocal of this, reverse that inequality, take a reciprocal of this. All right, that produces this implication. We're getting closer. Um, we took delta to be one over B. So that's equivalent, take reciprocals of both sides of this, to saying one over delta equals B. So negative one over delta equals negative B. We had a negative one over delta here, replace it with negative B. Then we'll have that uh, two minus delta less than X less than two, two minus delta less than X less than two implies F of X, which is one over X minus two is given, is less than uh, negative one over delta. I, I mean, negative B. And that's exactly what we were trying to show. If this occurs, here's where we suppose this occurs, then that implies this occurs. Here's the f of x less than negative b stuff. That's the definition of these symbols here. We have proved this claim here uh, using the formal definition of one-sided infinite limits yielding a negative infinity out as a limit. All right, and that's the end of uh, the examples. Awesome. That's the end of uh, the notes for this section. So that takes care of chapter two. Uh, probably having a test here at some point. I'll take care of that in the actual formal class and however we communicate. And uh, we'll move on to chapter three. Uh, don't lose heart. This was kind of the hardest part. All this limit stuff with the epsilons and the deltas and the capital B's and all that stuff. In chapter three, it's more mechanical. Chapter three is going to start out with some limit stuff. We're not going to prove limit stuff. We're going to use limit properties and you should be pretty comfortable with the limit properties. If you're uncomfortable with the limit of the sum as the sum of the limits, then you might want to be a bit concerned. But if you're bothered by finding deltas for given epsilons, well, you'll probably be okay. Uh, there may be some of that on the test, uh, but I'll give you a good warning about what I cover concerning that. Uh, but the, really the hardest part's over. It becomes more mechanical and computational from here on out. So on to chapter two, I'm sorry, on to chapter three, uh, derivatives, which are an application of limits. I will see you there. Have a nice day.